Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this It's been a while since the last stream, which I feel like at this point I now say basically every stream, which is a little unfortunate, um, but somehow life tends to get in the way. Um, this is one that I've been promising for, for a while. Um, so this is going to be a crust of rust on uh, build scripts and FFI, so foreign function interfaces, um, which is basically the way that you get Rust code to interact with code written in other languages. Um, and we'll, we'll talk some more about what that actually means. Um, th the reason this came about is because, you know, build scripts are decently well documented actually in the, in the cargo manual, but they're a very general mechanism. So it can be hard to wrap your sort of brain around why it's why they're useful, what they should be used for, what they should not be used for, what their limitations are, uh, the, the patterns they usually apply when, when you do use them. Um, and for FFI, you know, there aren't great resources just talking about in general what's going on. There are some, like the, the Nomicon has a pretty good chapter on, you know, the, the basics of FFI. The Rust reference is pretty decent, talking about like the extern keyword. Um, but sometimes, as you know, is sort of the 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 standard for for crust of rust. It's useful to really just dig into an actual real example to see how the pieces fit together. Now, because this is a crust of rust, it's going to be you know on the on the shorter side as as far as it goes for my streams. Um, so I'm guessing about two hours. Um, and in two hours, it's kind of limited how much we can actually do in terms of implementing something that uses real FFI. Um, so I won't get too much into reverse FFI. So that is um, for other languages to call Rust, like to generate C compatible bindings from Rust code. I'll talk a little bit about it, but, but not too much. Um, and I, I also primarily be focusing on um, linking against C. Um, the, this, the mechanisms that we're going to talk about do apply to linking against other languages as well, like anything that is a C compatible ABI, um, including things like C++, but there are a lot of nuances to, you know, bridging the gap from the C ABI to the, the other language as well. And then that part is, uh, related to Rust. And in some cases, like it, it's pretty important what, what those distinctions are, but we're not going to dig too much into that. Uh, I'll point at some crates that might be useful, but, but that's sort of the extent of it. Um, there's also a, yeah, so, so someone mentioned in chat, uh, Ryan Levick has a great video about FFI and Rust, um, uh, uh, which is also worth checking out. I'll, I'll link it up here somewhere, um, in the, in the, uh, recorded version. Um, so I will talk a little bit about bind gen, uh, when it's appropriate to use, when it's not appropriate to use. I'll talk a little bit about C bind gen. Um, and in particular, the, the plan here is to um, write bindings to libsodium. Now, libsodium, if you're not already aware, let me see if I can make this dark uh, for those of you who are averse to the light which I know is, is many of you. Uh, apparently I cannot, that's fine. Um, yeah, so, so Libsodium is a uh, cryptography library written in C um, that is, you know, fairly widely, um, both widely used, but also widely known to be a, a very you know sane implementation of many of these cryptographic primitives. And in particular, it aims to be implementations that are hard to misuse um, and relatively low in configuration. Like it's really just, you wanna encrypt a thing? We have, this is the way you encrypt a thing. You want a random key to use for your encryption? We generate one for you in the appropriate way. Um, so it's intended to be sort of foolproof. Uh, and the other thing that's nice is it's written entirely in C, so the API is decently easy to bind to. Um, and, you know, it's it's a real library. It's not something that where I just hacked together a little C file because th that way we'll, we'll get a feel from some of the subtleties that are involved. Um, okay, let's start from uh, a little bit before we get to, to Libsodium and the actual bindings and talk about what build scripts are. So build scripts are effectively a program that gets to run before your crate is compiled. So the way this is structured in Rust is that, and it's a property of cargo. It's not a property of the of Rust, the language. It's entirely a cargo construct. Um, and, and the idea is that if, if you have a file in your 
uh, the, the root of your cargo project called build.rs, the root of your cargo package technically, um, called build.rs, then cargo will compile that file, run that file, and then build your, um, your crate. And it will do so even if your crate is being consumed by some other crate. Like build.rs runs in the context of whenever your crate is compiled. And because Rust always does, you know, the, the transitive compile, um, the build script that you run on your local computer, the output of it is not included in cargo publish. The build script is, but not its output, which means that the build script has to be written in such a way that it's going to run on other people's computers. And that's part of where it gets really tricky to get bind and script, or sorry, build scripts to, to always do the right thing. It can be fairly convoluted, you know, to, to handle all the possible ways in which your consumers' uh, build environments are set up. And we'll talk a little bit about that and look at some build scripts from, um, from other existing libraries as well that, that might be interesting. Now, as I mentioned, the, the build script is essentially just a program. Like it defines a, a, a main function that that's really the, the main entry point to a build script. It doesn't have to be called build.rs. Um, you can also in your cargo toml set like build equals and the, the name of the path and it'll compile that instead. Um, and you can use like a build slash main.rs and then have you know, modules and whatnot. We'll, we'll see some crates that do that as well. Um, if, you, if you end up with a very com convoluted uh, build process. Um, now, when that program runs, it, it, it doesn't really have, you know, any, any um, special integration with the crate that is actually being compiled. The, the way that these two communicate is primarily through environment variables um, and the out directory. So um, when a build script runs, let me see if I can go down here. Yes, yeah, so when the build script runs, it gets to emit, uh, it gets access to a couple of things. It gets access to the outdoor environment variable. And the outdoor environment variable is a subdirectory of target, sort of transitively, like deep inside the, the target out build output directory that is writable by the build script. Um, and when your crate is compiled after running the build script, the outdoor environment variable will be set for it as well to that same directory. The idea being here that the build script can like generate Rust files, for example, put them in outdoor, and then the uh, your your Rust code can include things from under outdoor um, and things and then get access to that generated source code. Um, so let's let's just sort of see uh, what that what that actually looks like. So let me do. Um, I guess we'll do a bin and we'll say build and FFI. Very boring crate name, I know. Um, so if I here make a build.rs, um, I give it an FN main. Um, and then I do standard and var outer. Um, and then I do cargo run. So you'll see what it does is I get a warning. First of all, I, this was just, I haven't changed my source libr.rs.r uh, .rs at all. The build.rs does not generate any code, nothing like that. Um, but you see that when I now run cargo run, I get a warning from the build script and that's cargo deciding to build my build script. Um, and then it runs the build script and then it compiles my crate and then it runs my crate. And you might've noticed you don't actually see the output from that build script. That might strike you as strange because in the build script, we did a print, like debug basically does a print. Um, and the reason for this is because build script output is not printed to the terminal unless the build script fails. Um, so we can see this if I here stick in a panic and then do cargo run, um, then you'll see that now, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here, you see it prints the standard error of the build script when it ran. But it does not do that if the build script succeeds. And the, the, the reasoning behind this is, is that build script tends to, they tend to produce a bunch of output. And we'll see a little bit about why they do that. And part of it has to do with the fact that in their output, they can issue special instructions to Cargo um, that, that allow it to like change the, the link search path and those kinds of things, set environment variables. Um, and so the, the standard output is going to be fairly large. And so therefore, Cargo just eliminates it by default. Now, it is possible to get at this output even if it doesn't fail. So let's remove the panic again. Um, 
Uh, oh, I have that set, don't I? Um, let me just see if I can't. Yeah. So I have uh, the cargo target dir environment variable set. Uh, so that all of my cargo projects across my host use a single target directory rather than having one per project, uh, which tends to save disk space and save on compile time sometimes. Um, but it's a little inconvenient in this particular case. Uh, so I'm going to unset cargo target dir, uh, and then I'm going to run, gonna run cargo run again. And now you'll see I'll have a, I have a target directory in the, in the current directory. Um, and if we now look into target and debug uh, and depths, uh, not depths, uh, build. So inside of target debug build, or it could be release if you're doing a release build, um, you'll see that there's a subdirectory for, uh, you'll see there's one for every crate. And in this case, there are actually two for this crate. And the reason for that is one is the build script and one is the crate itself. Um, so if we do star, you'll see that one uh, here, this is, uh, this is the build script being run. This is the build script being built. So this one here is, this is the result of compiling our build script. So this is sort of the crate that is the build script. And this is the crate that is the real crate. And included in there is the uh, output and the standard error of its build script. So if we do cat target debug build, uh, build an FFI, AFC uh, output, Standard output is empty, which is fine, right? We, we didn't print any to standard, to standard out because the debug macro prints the standard error. Um, but if we cat standard error, you see there is the output from that debug. Um, and if you do a build where, you know, you take a dependency on like OpenSSL, for example, the OpenSSL crate takes a dependency on a crate called OpenSSL sys, which has a build script that does lots of things in, with OpenSSL. And so if you build something that depends on it, you can use this to look at the output of the OpenSSL sys build script, um, even if it's deep in your dependency graph. It'll always end up at this kind of path. Um, and so this is really, really useful for, um, for, for trying to figure out you know, if the build script did something weird, what did it do and why? Um, it's a little hard to discover, but but it is really useful to, to know about. You're going to run into these kinds of things. Um, okay, so the outdoor environment variable, when our build script ran, um, you'll notice was this path. Uh, and you'll see that it's under the target directory, under debug, under build, and under this, um, this subdirectory of of build um, that is the same one as, unsurprisingly, where the output of the build script ends up. There's an out directory. And this out directory happens to, or not happens to, this is entirely on purpose. Um, if I here do, instead of uh, hello world, I'm going to print out config outdoor. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, not config um, env. And I'll explain why I'm using the env macro here and not um, standard env in a second. So if I now do cargo run, you'll notice that, uh, and I need to do it with env, uh, you'll see that this path here is the same path as this path here. Um, and that's entirely intentional, right? The idea is that this is a shared directory between the build script, so where it can put RS files or, or any other kind of file, um, and the, um, the crate that's being built that it can pull those generated sources from. Um, now, the reason why this is env as in a macro rather than uh, standard and var is because the env macro reads environment variables at, as set at compile time, not at runtime. So remember, for, for our main.rs here, there are two steps. One is you compile main.rs into a binary, and the second one is run that binary. And so this outdoor is only set at compile time. Cargo has no way of setting it at runtime, because you could imagine you build your binary, you copy it to another system, and you run it. There's no cargo involved. Um, so this is only set at compile time, and so we access it using env here. And you might wonder, okay, well, well how do I actually use this? Um, the way you use this in practice is you do something like, you know, standard fs uh, write to 
um, dot join hello.rs. Uh, and what are we going to write into that file? We're going to write uh, pub fn foo. Sure, pub fn foo. That's fine. It doesn't need to do anything special. Uh, we can unwrap in the in this build script. That's fine. And this is going to be standard path. And it gets sad because this and this. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm I'm creating a file inside of the out directory called hello.rs. I guess let's call it foo.rs maybe. Um, and it has a and it has a, a single function that does nothing. It's just called foo. So if I now do my you know same thing here. Uh, and then I ls what's in that out directory. You'll see that there's now a foo.rs file in there. And what I can do in my source main is I can do something like, you know, mod foo include. Um, so the include macro takes a path and at compile time substitutes the call of the macro with the contents of the file. So this is, it's not eval, right? It's, it's a copy paste that file into here and then treat it as Rust source. So we can do, uh, outer uh, food RS. And at least now in theory, we should be able to call foo foo. Uh, and indeed we can, right? This compiled. Uh, and the reason being, you know, at maybe if I have, uh, do I have cargo install, cargo expand? Because otherwise, I want cargo expand. So cargo expand is a really handy um, tool for expanding macros and, and showing the result after macro expansion. And so that should show us that the actual code that gets compiled here after expanding the macros includes that inline source file that we just generated. Does that make sense so far? Like what the the connection here is between um, between the build scripts and and not. If I do expand, you'll see here the mod foo now just contains pubfn foo. This is the result of running cargo expand. And so our call here now ends up being valid by the time this actually gets called. Include is kind of like pound include in C. Yeah. It's more or less the same thing. Um, the uh, yeah yeah they're they're basically the same. Okay, so now we understand sort of how these connect together. And and uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, you know the outer is one of the ways that the build script can communicate with a crate being compiled. There are others. Um, so one is a a way for build scripts to communicate with cargo. Uh, which is not really about the, the crate being built, but rather telling Cargo, I have discovered a thing that Cargo needs to deal with. Um, and these are all by printing to standard out something that begins with Cargo colon. And there are a lot of these. Um, so there's Cargo rerun if, we'll talk about those in a second. There's Cargo Rust C, you know, various args. This is usually used for things like um, you know, imagine you have a build script and it, it's looking for a particular shared library file and it discovers that it's not in a standard system path. Like it's not in user lib, for example, it's somewhere else. The build script can tell Cargo, hey, when you go to link to the final binary, also look in this directory for a particular library. Um, and so you can use the use a, using a Rusty link arg, which is to pass additional uh, flags to the linker. They don't have to be a path necessarily. They can be any linker flag. Um, or, you know, only pass this additional linker argument when building binaries or tests or examples or, or benchmarks. Uh, or uh, you can set Rusty link search, which is specifically for setting a search path. Uh, so it's, it's sort of equivalent to dash capital L for regular linkers. Um, you can also pass Rusty link lib, which is telling Cargo when you link, also link this library. And, and this is very often the, at least part of the job for a syscrate, right? Is that the build script is going to say um, which shared library to link against, which is does by emitting rusty link lib. This is equivalent to dash lowercase l, 
um, and if you're familiar with like linker syntax, um, and also where to find, where to search for that library, which is the Rusty link search, uh, which is, gives a path. Separately from linking, the other thing that you can instruct Cargo to do is to pass additional flags to Rust C itself. So that could be trivial things like, you know, uh, changing the optimization level or something. But very often what this is used for is in the context of uh, Rust C config. So what this will do, uh, and you can see this too if, if I do something like, um, uh, what's a good example of this? Config, hello. Right, so the config macro, uh, and this uh, the config macro is sort of similar to if you write this syntax, right? Um, that they both end up evaluating in, the, in sort of the name same namespace. Config is used for compile time properties, um, and these can be used for all sorts of things. But they're basically a way to say, you know, is this thing available or not? Uh, is this feat? So it, it's used for features, right? So um, you've all seen, you know, feature equals foo. So what this means is when Cargo builds your crate, it looks at what features are enabled and it passes to Rust C config equals feature equals foo, if the foo feature is enabled. And that turn that that in turn enables this, this Rust language feature. So this is no longer related to Cargo that allows you to do conditional compilation based on what these flags are passed in. So if you use this uh, Rust C config, then that means you know pass additional config flags like let's say you know one thing that the OpenSSL library does for example is pass in OpenSSL one one zero which indicates you know it's a OpenSSL is at least at version one point one point zero, and what that allows is that the the OpenSSL crate can then do things like config OpenSSL one one zero to say only compile you know this this function if OpenSSL is at least that version. So it's a way for the build script to inform the crate about conditional compilation options. It might need to enable or disable. All right, does that, does that make sense? Does the config aspect of this make sense? And what these sort of cargo uh, options do. We'll, we'll look at some examples of this later um, as we look at, you know, real build scripts. Well, one thing that's interesting here, you know, that, that people don't think about very often is the distinction here between cargo things and Rust C things. So config is a Rust C, like it's a, it's a language feature of just saying you can be you can conditionally compile based on properties that are passed to the compiler. And this is sort of similar to like in C where you can do like a, a, a dash D define, uh, and then you can conditionally compile based on that. Um, it's it has nothing to do with cargo. And then there are cargo features, right? Which you set in your cargo.toml. And what cargo does is it turns features into Rust C config flags, which you can then use to do conditional compilation. Uh, but the two are sort of disconnected. Uh, config is like if, def, and end if, yeah. Uh, and you can also access them through a macro like this. So you can say, you know, config um, OpenSSL110 in this case, for example. Okay. Uh, so that's the other way that we can communicate between build scripts and cargo and ultimately the crate itself. Um, there's w There are two more here that I want to touch on. One is cargo warning. Uh, this is... You know, I, I mentioned that in general, the output from build scripts does not get printed when they're run unless the build script fails. Um, cargo warning is the exception. So if a build script writes to standard out a line that starts with cargo colon warning equals, then the remainder of that message does get printed to like when cargo runs. Um, and, and we can try this, right? So if we go to our build.rs and we do uh, print line cargo warning, uh, equals uh, generating foo.rs. And in general, these are intended for warnings. They're not intended for like logging. Um, but if I now run cargo R, you see that I get this warning saying generating foo.rs. It's worth noting that 
these kind of warnings from the build script are only generated if you are working on that crate, if you have a path dependency on them. Uh, they're not generated if you have a transitive dependency on them. So for example, if the OpenSSL syscrate's build script uh, generates these kind of warnings, you will not generally see them when you do a build if you just happen to have a dependency on it. You'll only see it if you have a path dependency on OpenSSL sys or if you are specifically building OpenSSL sys manually. Um, Uh, and the other one is cargo colon key equals value. So this is um, metadata that essentially turns into environment variables. Um, and there's a lot more discussion of this in the the cargo book and the cargo reference. Um, but but basically, you know, if you if you emit something that starts with cargo colon and is not one of the like known properties, like let's say I say here include equals foo. Um, cargo colon include is not a special value in that list. Um, but what this does, if we then change source main RS, is it declares a uh, dep oh. It might only work if I have a links, which I haven't set up. Uh, Uh, that's a good question. Build and FFI. Include. Let's see if that's true. Uh, of course not. Okay, so the, the intention here is that you can emit additional information for your dependents that actually contain values. So config is for conditional compilation, but sometimes you want your build script to do things like figure out where the include directory for like a C dependency, for example, is and communicate that path to, you know, the, the downstream crate that builds because it might be useful for it to like, you know, pick up a particular C header file or something. Um, and you can do that by using the cargo colon key equals value syntax, and it will declare environment variables for those that, that those downstream builds can consume. Um, but the name of the environment variable is dep underscore the links attribute, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, but it's basically the, the library that the package links against underscore, and then the key and then the value out. Um, and th there's an example in here. We're not going to look at it because it, it's a little, um, little separate. Um, which in fact is a good reason to talk about links. So, um, in general, this is not a requirement is worth pointing out, but in general, if you have a crate that links against a particular shared library, you're supposed to declare links equal in the name of the shared library in that crates cargo.toml. Um, this doesn't do anything magical as far as, you know, linking is concerned. Uh, you're still expected to use things like Rusty link lib to tell cargo to also link against that library. You might still need to set the search path and everything. But what it does is it, it allows cargo to check that only one crate in the entire dependency graph links against the shared library. And this is useful because if you have multiple crates that try to link against the same library, um, you can get into really weird cases where they link against slightly different versions or they both statically link against something and therefore you get duplicate symbols. Um, it, and then you get like weird linker failures. So, so doing this allows Cargo to basically do a sanity check of the build that there's actually only one crate that binds again and again and against any given shared library, um, or or static library for that matter. Now, the, the there are some interesting implications here, which is because Cargo checks that only in exactly one crate or at most one crate, I should say. Um, links against any given, you know, library name, um, you don't want to end up with an ecosystem where you have lots of crates that provide bindings to the same thing. Um, in general, the way that we approach this in the Rust world is that for most shared libraries, we try to have a single crate 
called dash cis. So uh, this would be, you know, for libsodium, it would be called libsodium dash cis. That crate, the only thing it does is bind against the shared library and expose the, the sort of raw FFI methods to that library. It is not supposed to do any kind of like, you know, safe wrapping or providing an ergonomic interface, none of that. It is a pure binding to the library. And then you can have lots of different libraries that all use that sys library uh, and generate nice bindings on top of it. But the idea being that if because you only have a single sys crate that does the binding, um, that one has the links keyword, and that way you, you know, it just sort of works out that you only um, link against it in one place. Um, this also has some implications for semantic versioning. So if you have such a sys crate, one of the things that you want to do is try to avoid doing major version bumps to it. Because if you do a major version bump, um, what will happen is that it will be impossible to use that the the two use two different major versions of that sys crate uh, at the same time in the dependency graph because two major versions are considered two different crates um, and if two different crates both have the links keyword for the same name cargo will complain it won't build so generally if you cut a breaking release to sys um, you're going to want to make every consumer of that sys crate also bump to that new version sort of at the same time. Um, yeah, so I haven't gone into how you generate a syscrate yet. Um, I, you know, you can write manually, you can use bind gen, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, okay, so... There is, yeah, so, so it talks a little bit about this in the, in the cargo manual as well, about sys packages. Um, and it has some other nice properties, like you can override um, particular properties of links. Um, there's one more thing I wanted to talk about, which is two, actually. Yeah, so you can set um, in these uh, sort of uh, cargo output things from build script, you can also set arbitrary environment variables. This is sometimes useful. Um, but one key thing that you set with build scripts is rerun if changed. By default, if a crate has a build script, the build script gets rerun every single time that crate is built. Even if there have been no changes to anything, it gets rerun because cargo doesn't know the conditions under which it should rerun, right? Who knows that build script might, you know, fetch something from the internet that needs to be done every time. So the expectation from Cargo is that every build script, uh, if it knows it only needs to run in certain circumstances, should emit either the rerun if changed or rerun if and changed or, or both. You can emit multiple of them to say, run me if these files or these environment variables have changed, not otherwise. Um, so very commonly, you'll see things like rerun if uh, env changed for something like, you know, OpenSSL libdir, which the OpenSSL syscrate uses to locate OpenSSL. Well, if the path environment variable that the user uses to locate OpenSSL is changed, the build script should be rerun. And so therefore, that build script emits rerun if env changed, OpenSSL libdir. Um, Rerun if changed uh, is usually used for things like, you know, if you have a, if your build script compiles a little C program uh, into, let's say, a shared library file or a static library or whatever that your crate then links against, well, if the C file changes, the build script should get rerun. And so you can use this, um, this first stanza to do that. Um, okay, I think that's all I wanted to talk about for the for build scripts sort of generally, we're gonna dig into some and actually look at what they do and why. Mm. One thing to keep in mind with build scripts is that at least at the moment, they're very um, blunt tools. In, in Maybe not blunt tools, but they are, <laughs> in fact, I'm going to say the exact opposite. They're very sharp tools. Um, and you can easily hurt yourself with them because build scripts are not really sandboxed in any meaningful way, at least not at the moment. You know, they can go talk to a database, they can connect to the internet, they can read arbitrary files, they can write arbitrary files, you know, 
whatever the current user has access to, we should already be setting off alarm bells, right? Like things like reproducible builds sort of go out the window if a build script does something weird. It might just overwrite the files in source and now you've like lost changes that you had pending in Git. Um, it might, you know, read your, read all your documents from your home directory and upload them to the internet. Like build scripts are very sharp tools and they're sort of implicitly trusted because they're automatically built and run for all your dependencies, which is worrying. Um, and, you know, this is an, an example of with great power comes great responsibility, but but also they're very troubling because you don't really control what build scripts your dependencies have, and you were probably not auditing all of them. There is a bunch of work in here that um, in the, the sort of ecosystem of trying to figure out how can we sandbox build scripts in meaningful ways. Um, and one way to do that would be to do something like... Um, compile and build them in Wasm so that they have a very constrained API to the rest of the system for what they can do. Um, but this is like, it's, it's concerning um, and it's worth knowing about build scripts. Okay, with that out of the way, let's actually look at the build scripts for some very common crates. And uh, I forgot to change my GitHub to dark mode, so give me one second. Uh, I'm sorry to burn all of your eyes. It'll be over in a second, I promise. You can just close your eyes in the meantime. There we go. Okay, you can open your eyes again if you're aver aver if you have an aversion to the light. Um, we'll talk about bindgen a little bit later and see bindgen a little bit later. So the first thing we're going to look at is uh, there's a crate called git2, and it binds against libgit2, which is a bindings to the git a, the git um, c library but not the real git git c library but a reimplementation of git in c um, and it's it's a great little library um, you'll see that in its cargo toml uh, it take it takes a dependency on libgit 2 dash sys which is a path dependency here so there's one repository that contains both git 2 and libgit 2 sys if you look at lib, so this is the pattern that we talked about, right? Of having a separate crate that does the actual linking. Um, so let's look at libgit 2 sys and its cargo toml. Um, you'll see it declares build equals build.rs, which is not necessary. Um, if as long as your build script is called build.rs, cargo will pick it up automatically, um, but it doesn't hurt to declare it. This just allows you to name it something else. Um, you'll see it declares links equals git2, like we talked about. Um, and it has a bunch of features and whatnot. Uh, let's look at that build.rs. Uh, let me increase the size of this a little bit. So very often the, the pattern you'll see for these kind of sys crates is very similar. Um, in general, what they do is they first, first try to locate the library in question um, on you know, the standard system paths. Um, if they can't locate it, in the standard system paths, um, it looks for, uh, well, actually, I should change that slightly. It first looks at whether there are environment variables telling it where to look. If there aren't, it uses the system paths. Then it looks to see whether it can find the library it needs in that path um, and whether those are at the right version. And if it does, then it just you know generates the bindings and tells Cargo to links against it. Otherwise, um, it will often build that dependency from source. This is known as vendoring, right? So the package contains the source code of the shared library it links against and it'll build it for you into outer and then link against it. Um, and then usually, you know, however it ended up um, with the shared library, it'll also then use something like bindgen to generate Rust bindings to that shared library. Uh, and we'll, we'll look a little bit about what those bindings look like because th that's when we get into more of the um, the FFI space here. Um, so for in the case of git2, you'll see it reads out a bunch of environment variables. Um, and I have some opinions on these environment variables that we can talk about after we've looked at a couple of these. Um, one thing that's pretty common is to have a feature that says whether or not to uh, vendor the the crate in question 
which you can set to one if you wanted to always vendor, like never use the the one from the system, even if it's available, always build it from source. Or you can set it to zero if you want to say never build it from source. Um, and some crates will also have it as a feature. I forget what the libgit2 does. Yeah, so it has a feature called vendored that you know carries the same property of saying, if this feature is enabled for this crate, um, then build from source. Of course, the challenge with features is that they can get enabled anywhere in the dependency graph, and then they get enabled for all consumers of, because Cargo will only build a given package once, uh, a given crate version once. So let's say you know, you, you're, you're a crate down here, you take a dependency on git2, and you don't set the vendored flag, um, but you also take a dependency on you know, foo, crate foo, and crate foo also takes a dependency on git2, but with the vendored flag, then you will get it vendored. Um, because Cargo takes the, the the union of all feature flags set across the dependency closure. Um, so if you go back to the build RS, um, you'll see that first it looks at whether it's allowed to look for the, um, the system provided version of the library. So that is, if it's not explicitly asked to vendor, then it will look. Um, it uses this crate called package config. And this is one that you'll see used a lot um, in these kind of contexts. So the package config crate is a, a relatively thin wrapper around a command that ships on most Unix system called package config. And we can look at package config pretty easily. Um, so what package config does is you give it the name of a library um, and you say, you know, what information about that library would you like? In this case, we want libs. So we want the, the link properties used to get this library. And in this case, I just, for libsodium, I just get dash L sodium. And that's because libsodium is on my standard system path. So no dash capital L is needed. Um, so it can just be linked directly with dash L sodium. Um, it has other properties too, like uh, C flags, which is additional flags you have to pass to a C compiler if you want to compile this, uh, this library. Um, libs will often include dash capital L if it's in some other uh, system path. This is a very you know, standard way of locating shared libraries. And that's why you'll, you'll generally see that these syscrates will be using package config to locate the shared libraries rather than like implement their own mechanism for searching through user lib and the like. Um, and the other thing that's nice about package config is it lets you do things like version requirements. So you can say, you know, at least version um, or max version. Uh, you can say things like, I want to uh, link against this statically. Um, so you'll see here with dash lib, so I can also pass dash static to package config. And I'll say, if you want to link statically, then you also have to pass, pass dash p thread. Don't know why, but that's the rule uh, for libsodium. Um, and so package config just gives you the linker flags you're going to emit. Uh, and so, and furthermore, it actually prints, um, let me see if I can find, um, here after running package config, all appropriate cargo metadata will be printed on standard out if the search was successful. So what this is saying is, as long as you use this crate, not only will it tell you whether a given library was available, but it'll also output all of the necessary of these cargo standard out instructions uh, for a build script to do things like set the link search path and the, the linker args and stuff. So it's a really convenient way to, to uh, do these kind of bindings. Oh yeah, I can show the uh, path. So the way package config knows um, whether or not a library is available, where it's available, what version, is it uses um, the th these package config files, which, um, so there's a package config path uh, environment variables that you can set to tell package config to also look in other places. Um, but if we look at one of these files, you know, it, it really just says where the thing is located uh, where its lib directory is, where its include directory is, the name of the library, the version, uh, and additional, you know, um, uh, link properties, uh, link arguments that might be useful. So it's a very straightforward, you know, syntax for for declaring these. Um, so you'll see back to to libgit2 sys, 
It if it's allowed to use the system version of libgit2, then it creates a package config. It uses that to scan for a range of versions that it knows that it can bind against. It probes for libgit2, uh, and if it finds it, then it also walks the include paths. Um, I don't know why it emits this. This is probably so that um, when building the crate itself, it has access to, it, it knows where the include uh, files are. I'm not sure why it does that, but it does. This is just the, the cargo colon key equals value. Like root doesn't have any special meaning as far as build scripts do. So this is just to communicate information about where uh, the include directories are to the, the downstream builds. Um, and then you say it returns. Like if it finds it this way, there's nothing more to do. The, the build script here is done. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about how the, the rust side of the bindings actually get produced in a second. Um, if it doesn't find it on the, on the system path though, you'll see it, it emits this, uh, rust C config saying lib get to vendored. The reason it does this is because that means you can now do conditional compilation on whether or not you built lib get to from source, right? You saying, um, you know, using config lib get to vendored. I don't know whether they use this anywhere, but at least now this means that they can. Um, and then it does, you know, in, in order to build from source, um, so in order to vendor, it needs to have the source for the library that it's going to build. Um, and the way it does that is it, it has libgit2 checked out as a submodule. Um, but because when you git clone a repository, it doesn't include submodules by default. They have this extra, you know, stanza that if the submodule hasn't been checked out, then run submodule update in it so that you get access to the submodule. Um, this of course won't work if the build is sandbox, for example, because you wouldn't be able to run git commands because they need to access the internet. Um, but this is more of a... Uh, convenience thing where, you know, if someone wants to build libgit2 sys, you want it to just be, they can just run cargo run and it works. And so that's why you have these kinds of um, additional stances. Um, when you run cargo publish, what happens is, and we'll see if they did anything special with it, in cargo toml, uh, so you see they have a, an X, so cargo toml by, or cargo, when you run cargo publish by default, will include anything that's not ignored by git ignore. So if they haven't git ignored libgit2, all of libgit2 is going to include it as well. So basically the libgit2 sys crate source tarball on crates.io includes the source code for libgit2. Um, and you'll see this is one of the reasons why the version for libgit 2 sys includes this plus here, includes which version of libgit 2 itself is vendored and bundled with that version of libgit 2 And you see they have a, uh, an exclude stanza in here to say, don't include all these other files when you do a publish because they're just irrelevant and large. Um, and so in the build.rs, you know, once they've uh, made sure that they have the submodule, then what follows is basically all of the steps needed to build libgit2 from source. So, you know, it, it, it uses outdoor to figure out where to build it, like where, you know, what the scratch directory is essentially for, for building the artifact. And then it's all the, you know, traditional things of, you know, figure out what target you're compiling for. They use the CC crate, which is a, um, a uh, really nice crate that's the wrapper around, you know, a standard C compiler that knows about all of the standard environment variables like CC and AR and um, uh, LD and LD flags and C flags and CXX flags and CXX, like all of those things that, you know, the C world have accepted as things we use for, um, for compiling C code. Um, so you can just do CC build new um, and then, you know, set things like additional include paths, um, where to build, whether warnings are enabled. Um, and you see it, all of this is just, you know, someone had to figure out all the steps that are required to build libgit2 from source. Um, you see there are all these defines and then ultimately somewhere down here. So you see there, there are a lot of steps. Um, and so down here, ultimately it calls config, which is still the, the CC builder. 
dot compile, which is going to actually invoke the compiler and linker and stuff. Um, and at least as, as long as that succeeds, um, it's going to then emit all of the necessary, you know, Rust C link um, properties are needed, which the CC crate also takes care of emitting. It just emits some extra ones for Windows and, and Apple devices. Um, and then it emits some additional like rerun if properties here to make sure that if the vendored source changes, we rerun the build script. Okay, so that's like the, the entirety of the build.rs here. Um, any questions about w all the stuff that this build.rs is doing before we dig into how the Rust bindings of this come up? Oh, someone asked why the API for package config uses the name static with a K instead of C. This is because static with a C is a keyword in Rust. So you're not allowed to use it for function names, for example. Y you can, there's like, um, is it R? Which lets you, yeah, so you can use this to declare that the name of a function is specifically intended to not be interpreted as its keyword, but it means calling the function is a little annoying too. So most people just use, like the, the standard is, you know, instead of static, you use static, that tick. Uh, instead of class, uh, instead of crate, you use crate um, and, and so on. Um, does the user have to build the C library on their machines or can we publish a pre-built.so? Um, so cargo doesn't prevent you from including a .so in your build artifact. Um, and in very rare cases, it's a good idea. Usually not SOs, um, but you'll see this with like, um, more like .os or .as where there's like a, usually for embedded platforms where it's really annoying to build, you know, the, the, the hardware bindings for that device. And so they'll just bundle it with it. The problem with doing that is those artifacts are tied to your build and execution environment. So imagine for example, that you're building on, to take a stupid example, you're building on 64 bit Linux and someone else is trying to run on 32 bit Linux your SO will not work on their machine. Um, that particular example is outdated, but but any kind of like difference in target, um, difference in um, versions of libraries can come into play here. In general, it's safer for you to use whatever they have on their machine or build on their machine than trying to build the SOs for any possible consumer. It's not impossible, but, but usually you want to avoid it. Um, okay, so so all of the stuff that we've seen in build.rs right here, all it does is tell Cargo how to link against libgit2, right? Which is either just dash l git2 if it's already on the system, uh, or you know built from source dash l to something that's in the outer. But that doesn't explain how do we actually call into these functions. Right? Like, ultimately, that just means that the symbols are available in the binary, but how do we call them from Rust? Um, there are many ways to do this. Uh, if we here go to librs, you'll see that it actually has lots and lots of code in this um, librs that has this extern C keyword on it. You know, they declare lots of types, structs with repr C, all of this stuff. And that is one way to do it. Uh, and it's actually a fairly common one for very stable libraries. Um, so this is, you know, probably, a, I'm gonna guess that this was generated by BindGen and then manually changed to be better. Um, so this is a good time to talk about BindGen. BindGen is a tool that, uh, as it says, automatically generates Rust FFI bindings to C libraries. 
The idea here being if you have a C header file that contains, you know, the, the C function definitions and type definitions for an interface, you can call bindgen on it and it'll generate a Rust file that has the equivalent Rust types and extern FNs. Um, so if we went to... Doo -doo -doo, um, I wonder if I can pull this up easily. Like RS. Um, so this is the git2 source code. And if I go to include git2.h, and uh, I guess any arbitrary file in here, let's do something like uh, commit.h. This is just from the, the actual C library git2's uh, header files. One of the things that it declares is git commit lookup. If we go in librs, you see there's, you know, far down the file, I'm guessing this is, oh my lord, uh, down here, you see they have a giant extern C block that just has lots of function definitions. And one of them is git commit lookup. And here, you know, they have the Rust equivalent types for all of the arguments. You know, this takes a git a pointer to a pointer to a git commit, a pointer to a git repository, and a pointer to a git OID. Um, and those are the, these are the Rust equivalents of those arguments. And this is also how you do FFI in general, is that you declare, so extern, um, how do I want to describe this in the best way? Um, the extern keyword, all it really does is it changes the calling convention used for that function. Um, it says that, you know, in order to, if you call this git commit lookup, it, there are two things that are different with extern. One is you don't give a body for the function, which is to say this function is not defined here. This is a declaration of the function, but it's not the definition of the function. Or I get that backwards. It doesn't contain the body of the function. Basically, extern is saying this is defined elsewhere. So just look in the symbol table of the binary, and if, if you see a call to this, actually call that. Um, and then it changes the calling convention to say, you know, if you just write extern, so extern fn, or in this case, an extern block with an fn inside of it, what it's saying is use the C calling convention for this function. Don't use the Rust calling convention, use the C one, um, which is what you would expect. And for anything that is extern C, you have to make sure that all of the arguments are, you know, the the valid C equivalent argument. So basically any struct here has to be repr C so that it can actually be used over that kind of, um, that kind of call. Um, and so if we went here and looked for, you know, uh, struct git commit, oh, it's a pub enum. Ah, so this is another pattern you'll see sometimes in FFI, pub enum with an empty value. What this is saying is, git commit is an opaque type to us. So in a bunch of places in the code, we're going to pass around, you know, star mute git commit. And what we're saying is, we don't want to try to turn git commit into a Rust struct. Like git commit is defined somewhere in the git2 library, but we don't, like its internals are none of our business. We're only ever going to pass around pointers to it and then use methods to get access to inner fields. Like if we want to look at the author of a git commit, we're going to call like git commit author and pass in that same pointer. So this is a way to say this type is really just an opaque type that we're only ever going to handle through pointers. And you'll see this is the case for, for a lot of these types. Um, there are some that, are, that that's not true for. So git rev spec, for example, you see we actually have a, a struct defined for with rep C with fields. And here, the assumption is that git rev spec is defined here to be the equivalent of how it's defined in libgit2. And in this case, they've written all of these out manually. And there are some upsides and downsides to this. The upside of this is you can control the exact layout for all these types, not just the layout in sort of a memory sense, but you can control like the naming of every field. You can control... Um, the the exact, you know, the, the, there's some type definitions that are equivalent, but are different ergonomically. Um, you can, you know, add, 
accessors. Um, you can implement clone as you want. Like you have more control over exactly what the bindings are. And over time, they're not, they're, they're stable. Like you implemented these and then you can just keep using them forever. You know that, you know, the the definition of git ref spec here is not going to change under you because you wrote the definition. It does, however, mean that if the underlying library, like if libgit2 changed in some way, um, and it matters for the bindings that you wrote, you're going to have to change those bindings. The alternative to that is to use something like bindgen. So what bindgen does is it, it takes the C header files and generates a file like this for you. So no longer do you write this by hand, it gets generated for you by a program, but that also means you have less control. Like bindgen is gonna generate sometimes some very convoluted bindings that are gonna be hard to, you know, sit down and manually read. They're gonna be fairly unergonomic, but they are in general going to be correct. Sometimes there's some really subtle things about making sure the memory layout is exactly the same between the Rust type, type and the C type um, that bindgen, you know, will know about. And if you handwrite these bindings, you're going to have to know about them. The problem with using something like bindgen of, of automatically generating the Rust bindings here is that they might not be stable over time. So if bindgen changes, it might start generating different Rust code for the same C code. And so this can be a, a backwards compatibility hazard for syscrates. Imagine that your syscrate just calls bindgen in build.rs. Uh, and th this is a fairly common pattern, by the way. Um, in fact, we can, we can show how that works. Um, so if I pull up the bindgen docs, uh, ba -ba -ba -da 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 -ba -ba, library usage, uh, tutorial. Yeah, so you add a build dependency on bindgen. Oops. So build dependencies are dependencies of your build script. Um, then you create a wrapper.h, and in our case, that's going to include uh, sodium. And in your build.rs, I guess we can just copy paste this whole thing actually. And we'll see it, what the contents actually are, but um, we don't need extra crate here. You see it, uh, this assumes that you already have the necessary uh, link stuff. So this is where you would use something like package config. In our case, we can probably just do um, link to sodium. Uh, rerun if wrapper.h changes. Um, and we say, you know, bind gen, generate based on what's in wrapper.h, and write the bindings out to outdoor bindings.rs. So if I now run cargo r, it'll build bind gen. Um, oh, so, so before I go into this, someone asked why, uh, why are these empty enums rather than just being unit structs? The reason is because you don't want someone to be able to construct an instance of it. Um, because you're saying these are, this type is entirely managed by that library. You don't want someone to be able to construct a pointer to one out of nowhere. Um, and an empty enum is impossible to initialize. In Rust, you can't create a git commit because there are no val valid variants. And so this is a way to tr truly declare this type is opaque as far as the Rust side here is concerned. If it was a pub struct git commit semicolon, um, you could just construct it by saying, you know, git commit. And we don't want people to be allowed to, to construct. Um, right, our source main is going to have to change because now, you know, let's, let's name this FFI. And this is now going to be bindings rs. All right. So now, uh, if we go into build, no, target debug, uh, build, no, uh, build, build an FFI. Ooh, let's actually print out 
Uh, doesn't want to let me do that. Yeah, so you see we're getting lot. In fact, this already prints the path, what am I talking about? Uh, you see we get lots and lots of warnings now. And so if I open this file, which is going to be giant, you see this is in the out directory of the build script, bindings.rs. And you see it says automatically generated by Rust bind gen. And you see this is taking the sodium.h header file, which is the main header definition file for all of libsodium, and generating the equivalent Rust bindings for everything in there. Like every type, every function um, now gets a generated thing. But of course, this is huge. Like this is lots of stuff and everything is marked pub, which means that if I publish this as a syscrate and then bind gen changed, usually the, it ends up being a major version change, but even so, if I try to upgrade bind gen, I have to make sure that my public API did not change at all in backwards incompatible ways, because if it did, I would have to do a new major release of my syscrate, which as we talked about, because there can only be one crate with links for a given library, I would also have to make everyone who uses my syscrate also bump there. So it ends up being this like giant um, explosion of things that have to change. Usually you can draw the boundaries at the crates that use the syscrate because their API can usually stay stable, but it's still a major undertaking if you have these, um, these uh, syscrates just use whatever bind gem produces directly. Um, but it is also really convenient because it means you don't have to hand write these bindings. There are a couple of ways around this. So for example, um, you can have a private module that includes the, the bindings, and then you can have a you know pub use FFI, the specific things you want to expose from there so that you don't expose the whole thing. Um, you can also um, you can also in your build.rs, and we'll, we'll do this once we actually start writing these bindings for real, um, you can do things like um, blacklist function, oh, blacklist functions or types to say, you know, any type that contains, I don't know, foobar, don't include in the bindings. Or you can even do this the other way around where you can do white, whitelist um, only include things that include, I don't know, a crypt box. And that way you're limiting what bindgen will actually generate bindings for. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at that when we actually look into the, the libsodium API. Um, so so you, in general for syscrates, you wanna find ways to ensure that your public interface is at least somewhat stable. And for libgit2, the way they did the, this was just check in the bindings whether they're auto-generated and then tuned or, you know, they were entirely auto-generated and just checked in or they were handwritten, check them in so that you don't generate them automatically on every build. Um, and in fact, this is one of the reasons why the bind gen crate comes with a command line tool as well that you can use to generate the bindings just as a once-off. Um, okay. So that's what bind gen does. That's the, the sort of... Uh, step for generating these bindings that libgit2 libgit does not make use of. Um, it just handwrites these instead. Um, before we get to libsodium, I want to continue walking through some the build scripts of some existing crates to do this, just because it's useful to see a little bit of variety here. So this is the SSH2 crate, uh, which generates bindings to the libssh2 C library. Uh, it also has, you know, a workspace with two crates, one called lib, uh, ssh2 and one called libssh2sys. If we look at it, you're going to be unsurprised to see that its cargo toml says that it links against ssh2 and it has a build script. Um, and if we now go to its build.rs, in fact, let's look, look at its lib.rs first. You see it too has um, manually written bindings for the same reason, it wants to be able to control its stability over time. But you recognize a lot of the patterns, right? So you see these pub const. If we look at our the generated bindings here, you see bindgen also generated a bunch of pub const, right? And I'm I bet you there's a uh, if we go down a little bit, so you see it generates a lot of uh, pub type, which are going to be type aliases for types that are used elsewhere in the definitions. Um, and some of these, you know, we don't really want it to be using, like it shouldn't need to generate bindings for max align T, 
so some of these we would we would sort of allow list or block list. Um, but I want to see if I can find some non-trivial types here. Uh, yeah, so here, for example, you know, there's a type crypto state. This is an example of something that should probably just be an opaque type. Right? Like we shouldn't be knowing about the field called opaque here. So this is something that we might, you know, in manual bindings, turn into one of these because we know it should never be constructed in the first place. Um, so th th those are examples of patterns that BindGen doesn't know that we want to treat that type that way. And if we look at the, um, the BindGen documentation for Builder, you'll see that it actually has a lot of um, configuration options. So you can say things like, how do we want it to generate the equivalent Rust code for C enums? And there are a bunch of different options. Uh, if I minimize this, you'll see you can say things like um, whether to generate comments, um, which things to allow list and block list, um, you can inject arbitrary Rust code or C code. Uh, you can mark a type as opaque. So this is the example of it's going to generate, you know, a, an empty enum instead of actually trying to traverse into the fields. Um, and so we'll end up using a bunch of this um, when we when we work with Libsodium. Type aliases, whether to derive different um, different traits. Like sometimes for FFI types, maybe you don't want to derive any of them and implement them all manually. Um, you can control that here, whether to support namespacing, uh, what to do with callbacks. There's lots and lots of, um, of stuff you can do in BindGen here. Um, so back to SSH2, if let's look at its build script. And this is going to look pretty familiar, right? Um, it's going to down here. So libssh2 is a little weird. Uh, by default, it doesn't use package config. It requires you specifically opt into it. And there's some debate about whether that should be the case or not. But if it's allowed to use package config to discover the system one, uh, then it will use package config like we talked about and use find library for libssh2, which you know automatically emits the necessary builders cargo instructions. Um, it also sets the include path, which might be convenient for downstream libraries. Uh, and then it returns. So this is the same structure as we saw for libgit2. You'll notice that this doesn't set see any uh, it doesn't set any version requirements for the library at all. Which, if you can avoid it, is nice because it means that in more cases you can avoid building from source. Uh, and you see it does the same. You know, libssh2 is checked out as a submodule. Make sure you actually check out that submodule so that you can build it, and then go and try to build that entire C library from source. So it creates a, uh, where is the config, a CC build into outer, and this will all look familiar. You know, it does all these other things it might need to do to set the include paths. And in fact, here, you know, this is a depth Z include. This is an example of one of those cargo instructions using just key equals value. So this means that there's a the libz syscrate emits a you know cargo colon include equals of its include path for the z library, the compression library. And we consume that here so that we can tell our build of libssh2 to also discover the include path for the compression library by using this, this um, environment variable, the cargo automatically sets based on cargo colon key equals value. Uh, and you see, you know, if we consume an environment variable, we also tell cargo about it so that we get, re get rerun if it changes. Um, and it does some stuff to you know, parse out which version of libssh2 we actually used, store that in a file, and then builds ssh2, and then it's done. Um, you'll see the you'll see the mention of this VC package as well. This is um, if you're on Windows using uh, MSVC, then you can't use package config because it's Windows, so you have to use uh, VC package instead. Uh, so nothing terribly surprising here either. Um, you'll see it makes slightly different decisions about whether to use things from the system or not. 
And uh, there are other examples here. Uh, so the OpenSSL crate is a little bit of a beast because there are so many different versions of OpenSSL and different variants, like there's LibreSSL as well. Um, you'll see if we go to the, it actually has a subdirectory for its build script. So it's build slash main.rs because they have all these other things to use. Um, if we look at the main.rs here, it looks somewhat um, familiar. So it um, finds OpenSSL, uh, links against it, tries to find the version by looking at the include directories, um, determine mode is it tries to figure out whether you want to build against OpenSSL statically or as a shared library. Um, and if we look down here at determine mode, it's down here somewhere, I think. So it, it reads this environment variable called OpenSSL static. This is also a pretty common pattern in syscrates where there's an environment variable called the name of the library underscore static. And if it's set to zero, then we don't statically link. If it's set to anything else, then we do statically link. And if it's unset, then we just, we um, use the fact, use whether or not a dot A and a dot SO exist to decide what to do. So if only the dot A exists, then we statically link. If only the dot SO exists, then we dynamically link. Um, and if it contains both, then we do a, a dynamic linking. So this is like, you know, the OpenSSL one has taken a lot of care to try to make sure that every possible combination of flags work. Um, and I don't think we're gonna dig into too much of all the details of what it does. Um, but if we go down here a little bit further in main, you'll see it does find OpenSSL, which calls this function, find OpenSSL, which if the vendored feature is enabled and we haven't explicitly through an environment variable said don't vendor, then use this find vendor module to get OpenSSL and you know find vendor is gonna check out the source, do a build and then link against it. And otherwise, so that means if the feature isn't set or the feature is set, but the environment variable to not vendor is set, then find it from the system paths, which is going to use package config. Okay, so, so this is a very long you know, procedure of steps, but you'll see that they're fairly similar between these different libraries. The general pattern is if you can use it from the system, then use it from the system. Otherwise, uh, build it from source. Um, what I would recommend is if you're doing this yourself for some library, um, think really hard about whether it's worth vendoring. Like vendoring is convenient for consumers, right? Because it means that if they don't have the library installed locally, you just build it for them and it works. But the chances that building it from source is extremely complicated and error prone is pretty high. And so there's a decent argument for if you can't find it in the system, you should just error and tell the user to install this library instead. Like in the case of Libsodium, if someone doesn't have Libsodium installed, I don't want to have to build Libsodium from source. So instead, our build script can just issue an error saying, install Libsodium and then try again. Uh, and that's what we're going to do as well. We're not going to try to figure out how to build it from source through CC in, in Rust. I don't think it's worth it. Um, the other thing is how you decide whether or not to vendor. It's also somewhat convoluted. It seems like the general best practice that's emerged is you have a feature that lets people opt into vendoring if they specifically need vendoring. I, I don't know why that is, but if you specifically need vendoring, and then you have a, an environment variable that overrides the feature saying never vendor. And the reason this is useful is because there are some um, users who have very strict requirements about how um, source code is brought into their builds. Like if they're trying to do hermetic builds, for example, or you know, if you're at a company and you want to make sure every source that's brought in has been like checked in all sorts of ways, you generally don't want any vendoring. You want to make sure that everything is provided by your build system. Like imagine if you're in something like, you know, Buck or or Bazel or whatever, you want to you want it to error if OpenSSL wasn't available because that means it hasn't been declared in like the standard build environment. You don't want like most of your application to use one OpenSSL, but your Rust parts use a different OpenSSL, usually not what you want. Um, and so in general, you want to provide this kind of override mechanism to say, if 
you can't vendor, if you can't, sorry, if you can't find it in the system, then I just want an error. I don't want you to build it yourself. Okay. So now we've looked at a bunch of these, um, these other libraries and how they do their, um, their bindings. So let's now talk about libsodium. So libsodium, no, I'm not going to go through all of like what it does. That's not really important for what we're looking at here. Um, also libsodium does have rust bindings. So there's a, a crate called libsodium sysstable, uh, which does basically everything that we're going to do today and more. You'll see it has a, it has a build.rs and that build.rs, you're going to be unsurprised to learn, um, you know, uses package config and to find the library. If it doesn't, it vendors it by building it from source, like all of the stuff that we just saw. Um, and it too has, you know, in its source, it has sodium bindings, which have all of these auto-generated things from bindgen. It has a script that calls bindgen to regenerate that file, but that way it's not automatically run, so they can choose when they re regenerate the bindings. And then it has a lib.rs, which just pub uses everything from the generated bindings. So what we're building today is not intended to be like published as this is the thing to use. Use the one that already exists. In fact, they're even like, you know, nice ergonomic wrappers around the FFI stuff, um, which is usually how you want to structure this, right? You want the syscrate to just be the FFI bindings, and then you write another crate that provides like safe wrappers and ergonomic wrappers about every, around everything. Um, a vendoring usually means built from source, yeah. Okay. So uh, let's now figure out what to do about Libsodium. So the place we're going to start here is installation. I've already installed Libsodium. I installed it just on my system. Um, so let's now go over here and uh, I actually want to exit from that. And I want to do cargo new uh, lib and we're going to call it Libsodium. Sys. And in our cargo toml, we're going to say links equals sodium. Uh, and in our build dependencies, we're going to steal that from over here. And then we're going to we're going to do exactly what they tell us to do, which is wrapper.h, which doesn't include sodium.h. So this is basically copying over what I what we had uh, elsewhere. We're going to copy the build.rs. So in this case, I'm not going to be too concerned with uh, oh, I'm not going to be too concerned with API stability for this one. Um, test, I guess that's fine. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not going to be concerned with um, API stability, so I'm just going to run bindgen at um, at build time. And we can do a little bit better here. Like here, we could use uh, package config. So if we do docs package config, um, we just do in our cargo.toml, we're going to say another build dependency is package config equals uh, 0 0.3. And so up here, we're going to say uh, and you see here in the in the docs for package config, it says not recommended to have no version requirements. And the reason for this is because it's unlikely that your your bindings truly are not do not have a version requirement, right? When you generate the bindings, you're generating them from a particular version of the C header files. And that means they're going to include, you know, functions that exist in that version, but not earlier ones. So you do generally want to include like a, an at least version. Um, so we'll we'll do that too, like so. Um, probe sodium, and you know, if if you're curious about what version the sodium is, we can do that with. Uh, So 
you can provide version requirements to package config too. And you'll say here, I just put in a version that I happen to know works. It says dependency requirement libsodium greater than 1.0.18 could not be satisfied because libsodium has version 1.0.18, which suggests that we that's where we should start, right? We're generating bindings based on 1.0.18. So that's what we're gonna use. And package config is gonna generate the link search and the link lib for us. So those we can just remove. Um, we do wanna make sure that if the wrapper that we had changes, then we rerun the build script. Um, and this bind gen config, we're almost certainly gonna have some uh, th some things to change. Uh, and in fact, if we go back to the bind gen docs, go to the builder, um, allow list function. We want to do dot allow list function. So if we go back to Libsodium, we need to start somewhere, right? Uh, so quick start. Uh, that's a lot of stuff. I want to see. That's, I want usage or quick start maybe. Ah, quick start. Okay, there's a function called sodium in it. I just want to check that like the FFI bit works. So for now, what we're going to do is we're going to only allow list that function. Uh, and then we're going to generate the bindings based on that. Why does it not, am I blind? Oh, it's because there's a newer version of BindGen. The tutorial is wrong. That's why. Uh, the package config command line tool is a Linux tool. It's unrelated to the, or it is not provided by a Rust package. Okay, so it says um, package config could not find system library sodium. Oh, that's because it is not called that. It is called libsodium. Great. So um, if we try to do something like build with verbose, uh, touch wrapper.h, which is going to redo a bunch of the things. What we'll see here is at the build at the end, you'll see it includes uh, dash L sodium, which comes from package config. You'll also see it does this, dash capital L, so search path, user lib. This is, I'm gonna go with a bug in package config, which is that it will emit the, the cargo instruction for setting the dynamic library search path even if that search path is the standard location for search paths, for, for shared libraries. And so we want to opt out of that because that's just wrong. And it causes them really hard to debug um, problems sometimes. So I want uh, print system libs false. So if I now run this, you'll see it just does uh, dash L sodium which works because libsodium is in user lib for me. Okay, so now we have, at least in theory, um, it, our build.rs is gonna generate the bindings for us and hopefully it just generated the sodium init uh, function. Uh, and our lib.rs currently doesn't really, uh, source lib.rs, uh, currently doesn't do anything. Uh, so what we want here is something like mod FFI, uh, include, Concat env outer bindings.rs. And I forget whether there's a, what does bindgen tell me to do here? Yeah, great. And they say to allow these things. So what we'll do is we'll actually allow them on just that module. 
And so in theory here, uh, we should now be able to do pub use FFI sodium in it. You see, I got auto completion here. It's because the 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 build script was run, and so this include actually you know it's just a regular macro that includes that file which exists. So if I here do you know FFI colon colon pub use FFI colon colon, I actually get what's in there, and you can see here the the signature the bind gen generated for sodium in it is it's an unsafe FN that returns an I32. And in fact, you know, if we uh, if we go to definition on this, it's not gonna let me do that. That's fine. Um, show me. Uh, I want that file. It's gonna be target debug build. Yeah. So if you see if I ls there, you see it, it generates. Um, Directories for all sorts of the dependencies that are built. In our case, what we want is libsodium sys, which has a bunch of different files. Uh, and the one in particular we want now is anything that's slash out, bindings.rs. Why there are two of it, I'm not sure. But let's go look at this file. See, this is what bind gen generated. This is an extern C block, which says for these, these are defined elsewhere and they use the C calling convention. Uh, it's a pub FN. Uh, every extern function is inherently unsafe because we don't know whether the signature even matches what the real function does, much less what that function does in the first place. So th there's no need to write unsafe here. It just is unsafe. Um, Sodium init takes no arguments, which makes it really easy to generate. And the return value is a, a C int. Great, so far so good. Um, and if we go back now to libsodium, you'll see here that they also recommend use it using package config to link against it. They say that in you know int main, all you have to do is run sodium in it, and if it returns minus one, then it's an error. Otherwise, use the library. In fact, sodium init initializes the library and should therefore be called before any function provided libsodium. It's safe to call this function more than once and from different threads. Subsequent calls won't have any effects. Okay, so this is pretty common in C libraries that so you have like an initialize function you have to call. Like for GTK, this is the same. Um, there are ways in Rust to like run a function at load time. Uh, so there's a crate called CTOR um, that lets you annotate a function with CTOR and it'll run before main. Uh, as long as your, your crate is actually included. And we could do this. We could have a, a CTOR for our library that runs sodium in it, and then everything else just uses it. Now, the the downside of using something like CTOR is that if there's an error, there's no good way to report it to the user. Um, and my guess, in fact, is that over here, uh, and it might stall, that's fine. I wonder if it tells us anything about the sodium init function must be called before any other function. It's safe to call sodium init multiple times or from different threads it will immediately return minus one if it's already been initialized. Yeah, so what we probably want here is actually something more like, um, you know, the, the, I hear I'm both doing the FFI bindings and the nice thing around it in the syscrate, which is sort of a no-no, but just to demonstrate what's going on. Um, so if we now do, you know, pub, we declare a pub struct sodium. Um, we're going to mark it non-exhaustive because we want people to not be able to construct this type without... Um, without explicitly calling our constructor. Um, but we're gonna say it's clone and it's debug. And then we're gonna do impl sodium. And this is gonna return, you know, a result of self or we don't really know yet. Uh, and what that's gonna do is unsafe FFI sodium init. And if this is 
less than zero, then error. And it's going to be a pubfn. So the intention here being that you know any other function that we want to declare that uses libsodium is going to be like I don't know I don't have a good example. Um, ah, bindings for other languages. Uh, quick start in FAQ. I want to write bindings for my favorite language. Where should I start? Start with the crypto generic hash API. Okay. Great. So that's probably the function we want to start with. So, you know, there's going to be a, a function like this. And by doing this, I don't know what it's going to return yet. What we're basically guaranteeing is that the user will have called, like we, we will have satisfied the library invariant that sodium in it has been called first um, by virtue of calling, by, by virtue of having a sodium, which they can only get by calling new. There are other ways to do this too, right? So you can have an init um, and you could have like a, a static has been init, um, which starts out to be, uh, in fact, this could be something like a one cell of a bool that starts out as being one cell new false. Um, and and then we could have in it instead do you know if basically if it hasn't already been inited then in it and that way you don't need to actually keep around self you could just have every function down here like assert has been in it the problem with doing it that way is that you're going to enforce this at runtime rather than compile time if you have an api like the one we originally started with um, you're going to guarantee at compile time that in it has been called uh, Non-exhaustive on a struct uh, mostly has the effect that um, you can't, that external users, as in users of this crates library API, um, cannot construct one of these or destruct one of these. Um, they have to use our constructors. So it works for, um, basically this has the same effect as giving this type a, uh, a non-public field, same effect, uh, but without needing the extra field. Uh, okay, so this is this now does FFI. Like if we now do here, you know, it works. We should be able to do sodium, sodium, new, um, and dot unwrap. Uh, lip sodium. From cargo test. Okay, so this this now called sodium in it, right? We 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 know that it works because sodium new calls this, which calls sodium in it, and it should return an error if that returns a value that's less than zero, but it returned okay because the unwrap didn't fail. So we are now doing FFI, right? Where we saw that it links against libsodium. This test actually calls that method. And so it it works. Like we now have FFI working. Um, okay. Um, before we continue from here, is there anything in the path to where we are right now uh, that doesn't make sense or that you'd like me to talk more about? Uh, like separately from... Uh, uh, my words are escaping me. Um, does any of this not make sense? Is there anything you'd like me to go into in more detail? Um, is there anything that you think would be useful to get a second explanation of? Um, to talk at me. Um... I always wanted to port or write a wrapper for a simple C library for learning purposes, but every time I try to tackle that, it becomes very complicated to understand the C code. 
Um, so usually you shouldn't need to understand the C code as much as you need to understand the the C API. Um, and you know, with with something like BindGen, you might not even need to do that because it'll generate the equivalent Rust types for you. And all you need to figure out is like, what are the semantics of these methods? Like basically, how do you turn this the sort of direct unsafe C API into a nice ergonomic interface. Uh, and that can definitely be some work like we did with, with Sodium New just now. Um, and I mean, we'll, we'll try to do um, crypt generic hash too, just to see whether we can get it to work. Um, but, but most of the time you shouldn't need to dig deep into like the C code itself. Um, okay. So let's see if we can't get crypto generic hash to work as well. So we're now gonna go back to our build.rs and we're gonna say, in addition to allow listing that function, we're gonna allow list crypto generic hash. Um, great. And let's see what that generates. So if I now go back to my libsh, um, and in fact, we can get rid of the pub use here of the FFI. Again, remember, we should probably have the FFI bindings be in a separate syscrate and the ergonomic interface should not be in that syscrate. And then the reason here being, you're more likely to make breaking changes to the wrapping API, and you don't wanna have to do breaking changes to the syscrate because those are really annoying. Um, but for now, just for you know exposition, let's pretend that FFI here is a separate crate. This is a little easier to, to set up. Um, so let's look at what the binding that we got here was. Oh, there's something weird about my... All right, so crypto generic hash does this. Uh, aha. Crypto generic hash function puts a fingerprint of the message in whose length is inland bytes into out. The output size can be chosen by the application. The minimum recommended output size is this. Okay, so there's a constant here that we also want. Allow list uh, var. And we probably also want, in fact, we probably want anything that starts with this because there's a, a constant for the minimum and the maximum and for the, you know, recommended bytes. And so here, you know, th this is a, here they're basically giving the invariance that this API tries to enforce. And these are things that we should turn into um, basically invariants in our Rust code that we assert and panic on if they're wrong. Uh, why did the bindings use C int? So cint is not quite, they're not necessarily the same as u32. Um, sometimes the C ones are platform dependent, for example, and we want to capture that in the generated bindings, which is why we use the, the cint instead. Um, okay, so this suggests that there's gonna be a, there's an out. which is gonna be a uh, mute u8. There's, and in fact, you know, here we could use, um, because we don't require this to be initialized already, we could here say, um, oh, what's the rust? completely spacing on the un in it maybe on in it that's what it's called so we can say here maybe on in it uh, so we're going to take you know the the input which is going to be a u8 an output, or a key, I suppose, uh, and an output, 
And you know, there's an argument here for instead of having the the call to provide the output, we could allocate a vector internally, for example, and, and you know, do the right thing. Um, but now, if we now go to generic hash, let's go back to the definition of it. We want to assert that the output size is at least this. So we want to assert that out.len is greater than or equal to this. Uh, expected u size found u32. That's interesting. I wonder why. Let's go look at the bindings again. Ah, I don't actually want it to, I just wanted to regenerate the bindings. Um, target debug build libsodium sys star out bindings.rs. I don't want to look at this one. Yeah, so you see it, it actually did bring in all of these con this these um, consts now. I wonder why they're defined as U32s. You see, it did bring in exactly the two ones we wanted and then all of the consts. Um, so this is one way to just build up the bindings in a useful way is to just allow this specifically the things that you're like ready to handle. Um, okay, so what this means is as U size, and in fact here we can do um, this is what Clippy would also yell at us for this to ensure that if the type of this ever changed in the future, we could we would get an error saying that it might not fit in U size. U size from U32 is not defined. Um, what else did they require? Minimum required output size. Oh, minimum recommended. Okay, so we know it has to be more than min. Uh, we know it has to be... less than or equal to max. And we're not actually gonna deal with the um, recommended one because it's not something we have to enforce in the API. It's up, up to the user to try to fit that. Um, key can be null, okay? So you don't have to provide a key. Uh, recommended key size, um, but the key is gonna be the same, right? Let's go to our build.rs. So we should still get, yeah, key bytes min and key bytes max. So we're gonna do the same thing here where if let some key is key, then we're going to assert that the key length is key bytes, key bytes, um, okay. And then we should be able to do, you know, uh, out dot s uh, as mute pointer dot len in dot as pointer this is input this is input dot len uh, key is so let's do key and key len is if let some key equals key then key dot as pointer and key dot len. Otherwise, it's going to be pointer null and zero. I didn't like that. Did I do something foolish? <laughs> 
Okay, so here we're gonna do, um, so the out is a maybe on init, and the reason for this is because we know it's gonna be overwritten by the, um, by the generic hash method. And so we can just, we, we're totally fine with these, this being uninitialized memory that we get in because we know we're gonna be overwriting it. Um, and so here, in fact, what we can do is we can say that it returns a mute weight. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to, you know, we need to turn it into the appropriate type when we pass it in here. Uh, and that's going to be taking that and turning it into one of these. Why is this? That's fine. And this is going to be out as u64, as u64, and as u64. Um, go to definition doesn't work here because the definition is uh, the include, which is a little sad actually. Like if I do this, it just takes me there, and I, and if I go to definition on that, I get the include. Um, there might be a way to like go to implementation, but I can't find that now. Uh, this operation is unsafe. That's fine. Uh, and so here we, you know, we can say safety. We've checked the requirements of the function min max and the presence of self means that init has been called. And so here, um, I don't know what the result here is. What does it return? Why does it not say what the return value in? It doesn't actually say what the return value is. That's unhelpful. Uh, I'm guessing it's just success. Like if, so we're gonna do, you know, we probably want a real error value here. But it sounds like a lot of them just use like a generic failure error. Uh, so in this case, we're just going to use unit. Um, and so we're going to say, you know, if res is less than zero. So this is the same as what we did for init, right? Uh, then we're going to return error. Uh, otherwise, and we, we could do this if we want. Um, otherwise, we need to, you know, turn this into the appropriate thing, which is we know the crypto generic cache has overwritten the contents of out, and so what we'll do here is um, maybe an init, and it's like assume uh, it's array assume init slice. Slice as slice assume in it mute of out. And I think this one actually has a maybe an in it uh, slice as mute pointer which is what we actually want here. And these are of course unstable library features because why would anything be on? Fine, 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 fine. Set lightly, that's fine. Uh, so we want to feature 
Uh, maybe on init slice. Maybe on init slice. This is also pretty common, right? Where you're converting between the the types that the C API expects, which is usually you know the pointer to the first element of a slice, and the the real you know Rust slice types. Um, so in our case, you know when we call into C, we turn them into raw pointers, and then coming back, um, we need to then you know do the checking that we might need to do, and then basically assume that the C library did what it proposed um, or what it promised rather, and that now out contains the the appropriate bytes. So here, you know, we can do this and say safety um, uh, crypto generic hash um, writes to all the writes to and thus initializes all the bytes of out. Yeah. So the the question here then becomes. Uh, what does generic hash actually promise? Does it promise that it writes to all the bytes of out? Um, and I don't know whether it says... Yeah, it doesn't actually say that it does. Um, but it says the output size can be chosen by the application. Someone is saying in his chat that generic hash and Blake 2B, uh, which is what generic hash uses, guarantees that it writes the number of bytes you dictate, which is what we're what we're going for, as long as it's less than max, which we check is the case up here. Uh, and so as long as that is true, this is fine. So now the question becomes, you know, can can this actually hash something? So if I now do it. You know, hashes. I do sodium new unwrap, uh, and then I do, and in fact, um, sodium here can be copied too. All that matters is that new has been called at least once, just to make it a little more convenient to use. And because it can be copied, this can just take self. Um, so it hashes. We should be able to do call s crypto generic hash of. I don't know what the input should be here. Um, I wonder if they have like an example that'd be useful if there was like a a test that we could do. Aha, nice, let's use this one. So we're gonna say input is gonna be arbitrary data to hash. The B prefix here is saying this, use, treat this as a byte string rather than a UTFA string. Uh, let bytes is equals this. Um, the key, we're going to say we don't have a key. Uh, and the out, it's a little annoying that we have to have an out here. Well, one of the things that we could actually do here is with a slightly fancier const generics, we could make this generic over the length of um, output and key. And then put restrictions on it to say, you know, this must be an array that's short, that's longer than min and shorter than max, um, but I, sort of out of scope for this particular implementation. I, here, I just want to see that it works. So what we'll we'll do is we'll do a let mute um, out. And what do they use for out here? They do this. Yeah. So we're gonna do let mute out equals. Uh, Wonder if I can. I wish there was a sort of alloc here, but oh, maybe there is actually. So we can do maybe uninit, uninit uh, of FFI uh, crypto generic hash bytes. As you size, uh, and then here we can do mute out. And now the these bytes should be the the hash of this. So if I now do you know, uh, let me bring in in dev dependencies something like the hex crate zero four three. 
and I want to print line um, hex encode of bytes. And now if I do cargo test here, Okay, so both the tests pass. That doesn't really help us here. Oh, we probably want to say that it's okay for the... Uh, we're okay for dead code in here too. This is like a bunch of like never used for the constants. Um, but what I want here is it hashes uh, and I want to see its output. Okay, so prints a hash. The hash is the same every time. That seems promising. Uh, and if I change the input, arbitrary data to hash in Rust, and then run it, I get a different hash. So this seems like it hashes. It seems like we have the hashing API working. Um, and, and that's sort of all there is to the this this part of the FFI, right? Like you make sure that you get the, the sort of raw definitions working, the raw externs and the wrong types, uh, not wrong, raw types, um, which BindGen can really be helpful with. Um, and then you write wrappers that, you know, make the assertions that are needed by the, the real the APIs and variants, um, structure it with, with more ergonomic Rust types, and then you have a safe API that implements that's implemented on top of the raw um, API. Uh, check it against b2sum. Do I have b2sum? I do have b2sum. That's a good point. Um, I wonder if that will work actually. Yeah, fine. Uh, that's unhelpful. Can I set the output size here? Length. I need to know what this length is. Thirty two. So if I do L thirty two. 8 256 and this is going to be different because it includes a new line and hey we get the same hash so this hash that we got from doing the FFI is the same as this hash which is what we get from the real uh, Blake 2 nice great so now we have, you know, working FFI in this direction. Now, um, you might wonder, well, what about going the other way? Like, what if the C code wants to call Rust code? And the process is exactly the same, right? So, so well, mostly. So what you would do is, let's say that the C API expects a function pointer of some kind. Well, you can just declare uh, extern fn, this is Rust. And you have to make sure that, you know, the the arguments are, you know, valid C types. Uh, what is the actual definition of this? I thought I could just cheat here, but I guess not. Um, so you de declare a function like this, um, and then you know, let's say that there was some FFI function that required a function pointer to this. You can actually just do, you know, you can just pass this is Rust as. Um, I think you have to cast it specifically as like a star fn type thing but that's all you really need to do and then the the 
C code can treat this just like it would any other um, any other function pointer in C itself. It just happens to be calling a Rust function. Um, usually, the the thing you want to do here is you got to make sure that the that the type is extern. Uh, you got to make sure that all the arguments and all the return types are you know validated representation in C uh, and match what the C code expects to be calling. Um, and the other thing you want to be careful about is memory allocation. So in general, if you allocate memory in Rust, you'll want to make sure it gets freed and dropped in Rust. If you if it gets allocated in C, you want to make sure it gets deallocated in C as well. Where things gets weird is, you know, if imagine there's a C function that expects to call, you know, some callback you provide it and it's going to return memory. Like it calls a Rust function that returns like a vector or something, but cast into the appropriate array pointer for C. If C then tries to free it, you're going to be in for a bad time. So you want to keep track about where the allocations and deallocations happens. And usually it's best if it all happens either in the C code or it all happens in the Rust code rather than try to mix and match and remember. Um, the other thing that's worth knowing about is uh, no mangle. Uh, so no mangle, you can put on a function so that its name actually ends up exactly like this in the final binary symbol table. Um, if you don't do this, what's going to happen is the compiler is going to still compile this function, but it's going to be um, it's going to be have a sort of auto-generated name, which isn't a problem if you only ever pass pointers to it, but it can be a problem if you actually want to name this function from C. Like imagine that in the C code. You know, let's let's pretend that this is C. Um, you know, in C, you're going to have something like this is Rust uh, int uh, externs car. Right? Like, imagine you have this definition in C. Then it expects that the final symbol table of the binary has a function called this is Rust. So there's no function pointer being passed here. It's just a C implementation is expecting this function to exist under that name. So in that case, you actually have to declare this as no mangle to ensure it gets included in the final binary, right? So like it's basically it's pub uh, and also uh, pub uh, and also that it retains its name so that it actually ends up under the, the name that the C implementation expects. But that's all there is. Like, there's nothing more special about the FFI going the other way. It just makes sure that you match the calling convention and the types and the representations, and then you're kind of good. Um, okay. Uh, are you duplicating the out reference? Is that allowed? I'm not duplicating the out reference. I'm given, because what I'm saying here is that the the return type here is tied to the same lifetime as this. So if someone gives me a mutable borrow of this, the mutable borrow I give them back um, depends on this borrow. So they're not allowed to then continue using this mutably as long as this value still lives, which we can test in the in the test here. Like if I here tried to then do, uh, you know, bytes here is referring into out, right? Um, and this, is therefore also a referring into out. So I should be, I should not be allowed to do something like out zero equals one. Uh, or even this. And indeed I get the error, cannot use out because it was mutually be borrowed up here. One thing I could do here, right, is I could restrict this a little bit and say that the thing you get back is expected to be read only. There's no real reason to do that, um, but but we can if we want to. Um, okay, I think that's actually all I wanted to cover in this. We've talked about build scripts in a lot of depth. Um, we've talked about FFI in both directions, bindings. We did a basic binding to libsodium, which we've tested actually works. Um, is there anything else I want to talk about here? Let's see. So yeah, so Cargo gives an example of like what you use build scripts for, bundled C libraries, finding C libraries, generating Rust modules, 
platform specific configuration. Yeah. So th there's a, there's one last that I wanted to talk about, which is um, so there's a crate called auto config, um, and auto config captures. Um, Actually, there are two things I want to talk about, but let's do auto config first. Auto config tries to do something that a bunch of different crates were previously using build.rs for, and they were sort of doing it in ad hoc ways. And it's doing basically compiler feature detection. So the idea here is that sometimes, you know, you want your code to be compatible with old versions of Rust, but on newer versions of Rust, you want to take advantage of newer features. And auto config can let you do this because what it basically does is it can test compile a program and emit a config that you can do conditional compilation based on, uh, based on whether or not a given program compiles. So for example, you know, it can say, uh, declare a config if the compiler has this type, or if it supports nightly features, or if it has a given type available. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff you can use this for. Very commonly, it's used for, you know, uh, detection on whether you can use a particular nightly feature, detecting whether whether a given type is available, um, getting the sysroot from Rust C in case you need that somewhere else in your binary, uh, check whether a trait exists, um, check whether a constant exists. Basically, all of these things that you can do detection of in build.rs to figure out which conditional compilation um, properties you can make use of. Um, auto configure is a very light dependency, like it has no transitive dependencies, uh, and it's intended entirely to be used in, in build.rs. Um, and it's used by things like, you know, I think anyhow uses it to figure out whether it can use nightly features to, to do things like make backtraces uh, nicer. And so that's one way to have your, your crate optimistically or uh, conditionally use nightly features rather than making the whole crate nightly only. Um, there, there is some work on uh, config accessible. So this is also a, a good, uh, cool feature that we don't have yet, but config accessible is something that they're working on adding to the language. Um, there's another one, which is config version, I think. And both of these are gonna let you be, do conditional compilation based on whether a given path, so like a type trait constant, um, is available in the current version of Rust being used. Um, and this is gonna basically mean that you can do this without needing uh, auto config for a lot of it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was, so we, we talked about bindgen, which lets you generate Rust bindings for based on C header files. There's also a tool called C bindgen, which is the inverse. It takes um, a Rust API and it generates C header files that, that then let you call the Rust code from C. And this is useful if you say, uh, have a Rust library that you build as a shared library and you want to be able to use it from, you know, Python or Node.js or just C or C++, where those languages know nothing about Rust. They also expect to use the, the C ABI. And so you generate a, a C header file that they can then use basically their equivalent of bindgen to get bindings into their language and thus call your Rust code through the C ABI. If you happen to be talking between Rust and C++, um, bindgen doesn't work that well for C header files and calling Rust APIs from C++ when you're constrained to the C API is a little limiting. So there's a great crate called CXX, which tries to allow you to build a, a better, a, uh, a more ergonomic interface between specifically Rust and C++, it does require that you make some changes on both sides of the interface. So you have to be able to control the C++ code and the Rust code. Um, but if you do, you can basically use this little thing, uh, the, 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 like this crate, which lets you basically define the bridge between these two languages and have it generate bindings that are, that are much nicer for each language. So if you happen to be in that situation, I recommend giving um, CXX a look. Okay, I think that's where I want to end. I don't think there's anything else I wanted to talk about. There are examples of a lot of the things that I talked about today in the, the cargo book under build script examples. Um, so definitely give that a look too if you want to refresh some of this after the fact. Um, any questions at the, at the tail end here before we end for the day?
I think two hours is a pretty good estimate. Happy with that. Um, I don't know when the next stream is going to be. I've given up on trying to promise. Um, I've gotten some good suggestions for more Crust of Rust I could do. Um... I do have some longer implementation streams I want to do, but I'm not going to promise when I'm going to do them. All right. In that case, uh, thank you for coming out, everyone. Hopefully this was interesting and uh, I'll see you all next time, whenever next time ends up being. Uh, if you want to keep an eye out for when I stream, um, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I am generally pretty good about mostly tweeting things that are related to my streams or at least related to Rust. Um, there's also a Discord. I'll put the link in um, in the video description for, called for Rustation Station for the podcast that also has um, you know sub-channels for, uh, for streams. And so you can also keep an eye out there. All right. So long, farewell. Auf Wiedersehen. Goodbye.